Okay, hello and welcome. I am coming to you as a disembodied voice in the ether, and today we're taking a look at an AS physics paper. Uh, today's one is a multiple choice paper, so there's 40 questions in it. We're not going through every single one of them in detail, you may be surprised to discover. Um, so the general principle is I am explaining how to go about thinking about answering the question, how to go about you know, what the process is, what parts of your knowledge you need to be thinking about. I'm not actually getting to the answer. I'm not trying to give you a full working because we don't have time for all of that. So yeah, without further ado. All right, so first questions. These are vector uh, force questions, okay? Um, this one, essentially, you are looking for uh, A, a diagram that actually works, i.e. your resultant force should be going from a start of an arrow to an end of an arrow, as opposed to for... Oh, I need my pen. As a, So, for instance, things like... Uh, uh, which one is it? Yes, things like C, uh, where it's going from the end of an arrow to the start of an arrow. It's going the wrong way around. So those ones are the wrong way around. Um, and then also you want arrows that look the same as yours. Um, so yes. Okay. I think that should be decent. Yep, seems good. Okay. Right, let's move on then. So, which pair do not have the same SI base units? Um, to an extent you might know this, but otherwise the best way to go about figuring out SI units, if you don't know them, is to use formulas. So, if you're looking for pressure, for instance, you know that pressure is force divided by area, something like that, right? To, to work your way back to any quantities that you do know the SI units of, and then combine them using the formulas, multiply, divide, etc. Um, so that's the best way to go about that sort of thing. A lift is supported by two steel cables. The cables extend by one meter, one millimeter when a mass of 80 kilograms is added. What is the best estimate of the value of the Young modulus? So. Young's modulus is stress divide uh, is so stress is Young's modulus times the strain, right? You have the strain, you've got an extension and an original length, or thereabouts. Um, you have a mass, which is a force that you are adding, and you can work out an area because you've got a diameter. So the area and the force, that gives you your um, stress, and then the length and the extension, that gives you your strain, and you can work out your Young's modulus from there. When performing an experiment, a student should minimize the uncertainty. Anyone should minimize the uncertainty. Uh, in which case is the student reducing systematic error in a measurement? So. Um, essentially, the, the general principle here is if you are doing repetitions or something like that, there you are trying to account for and reduce random error. Whereas making some physical adjustment to your setup, that tends to be systematic error. Um, that's the best general way to look at this. Uh, so essentially, all of these three are using multiple measurements, right? Generally speaking, if you're doing multiple measurements, you're trying to reduce random error. So it's the other one, adjusting your actual system that's reducing systematic error. A calibration graph is produced for a faulty ammeter. Which ammeter reading will be nearest to the true current? So essentially what you are looking for is read on the graph you're, you're being given the reading. So you read across from here. So 0.2 is by here, 
0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8. Read across, get the true current out, and whichever true current is closest to what you put in, that's the answer. That's the simple way to do it. Um, okay, a car is going to accelerate uniformly from velocity u to velocity v in time t. On the graph, which area equals the distance travelled by the car? So, distance travelled is the area under a velocity time graph, right? Here is your time t, so you want the total area under it, and so it's going to be, what, n, p, s, u? Oh, and then they've sort of split it into various forms. So I think they're splitting it into a rectangular triangle. But ultimately, you want this this area here under the line. So that's that's what you're after. And then you're just trying to pick out the shapes. OK. A student uses a spring gun to launch a steel ball with a constant horizontal velocity, varying the height h, measuring the horizontal displacement r when it hits the ground. Which graph shows the variation with height h of the horizontal displacement r? So, this one requires a bit more thinking. Um, ultimately, it comes down to being a SUVAC question. So, it has a constant horizontal velocity, right? That means that the distance it travels is going to increase linearly with the time that it travels for. And then you have a falling object, right? You can use SUVAT to relate the time to the, in, to the distance that it's traveling. Um, so you can say that, for instance, S equals a half a T squared, because we have no initial velocity, so our UT is zero. You can rearrange this to get that your time goes with the square root of s. And in this case, our distance traveled is h. So we have time is proportional to the square root of h. And we just said, because we have a constant velocity, our total displacement is going to be proportional to the time, which is proportional to the square root of h. So it's going to be a square root shaped graph. And that's this one over here. OK. Two cars, x and y, are positioned as shown at time t equals zero. Is that a flying car? I think they're trying to show that it's further away, maybe? Yes, it's behind. Fair enough. Um, it looks like a flying car to me, but there we go. That's just me. Uh, OK, what is the value of t when x is level with y? So, here... The best way to do this is to set up equations for what is the velocity as a function of time. Uh, what is the position as a function of time, right? Position is initial position when you've got a constant velocity plus the velocity times the time it's traveled for. So for this, for x, it's just 30 meters per second times the time. For y, it's 20 meters per second times the time plus the 50 that it started with. When those two are equal, well, that's just an equation for the time. You've got 30t equals 20t plus 50. That's an equation that you can solve. Which statement is correct? This is just a knowledge question. It's a definition. Um, we're not going to go through it. Definition questions we aren't going to talk about because ultimately the, the mark scheme tells you everything you need to know about them. And unfortunately, you just do need to learn it. There is no great deep insight that will uh, help you there. OK, collisions between elastic spheres. If the collision is perfectly elastic, which equation must be correct? Uh, two spheres collide along the same straight line. OK, so uh, the collision is perfectly elastic. Um, it doesn't tell us anything about their mass, which is uh, 
interesting. Um, ultimately, the point that you need is you are conserving um, you are conserving the difference in and in, in speeds. Um, I think. Right, hang on. Let me let me find the mark scheme for this, and we will check what they are after. Here we go. Here is a mark scheme. Yeah, so what we are looking here is to conserve the difference. We are conserving the approach velocity, right? And what that means is if we become one of, the, if we sit on top of one of the spheres, we are conserving how fast we see the other sphere coming towards us, right? Now, in the first case, because they're going in opposite directions, that's u1 plus u2. That's the speed they're get it going towards each other, right? Whereas because they go in the same direction afterwards, the speed that one is going towards the other is v2 minus v1. And they need to be the same, and so we're looking for the answer d. Um, that's, that's the point we're after there. Um, so ultimately what they're trying to get at is the difference when you have u2 pointing this way compared to v2 pointing that way. All right. The diagram shows a man standing on a platform that is attached to a flexible pipe. Water is pumped through the pipe so that the man and the platform remain at a constant height. That is a very contrived system, but there we go. Uh, the resultant vertical force on the platform is zero. The combined mass of the man and the platform is 96 kilograms. So immediately we have a downward force of mg, right, due to gravity. The mass of the water that is discharged vertically downwards from the platform each second is 40 kilograms. What is the speed of the water leaving the platform? So, here what you are looking to use is force is, depending on how you find it, but the rate of change of momentum, okay, i.e. the force is the amount of momentum changing per second, right? Each second you are moving 40 kilograms of water, so you want the momentum of those 40 kilograms of water, and that will give you the force. That force needs to be equal to the force due to gravity, and that, because it's, it's a reaction force pushing up from here, where the water is being turned around. Um, so yeah, you want to equate those forces and you can get what the velocity needs to be, because m mv is your velocity and that needs to be equal to your force due to gravity. Okay, forces are applied to a rigid body. The forces all act in the same plane. In which diagram is the body in equilibrium? So, all of these apart from one, have balanced forces in terms of just purely linear, right? Your forces need to have, you need to have a net force of zero. Uh, so that rules out C, first of all, because C would be moving up. It's got a total force of F upwards. The rest of them are balanced vertically, so you need to balance your horizontal moments, uh, your, your moments, rather. Um, so at that point, that's what you want to be trying to do is make sure that around, say, the centre, you have balanced moments. Um, and if you do, you will find that A looks pretty good. A solid metal cylinder stands on a horizontal surface as shown. We have a cylinder of area A, height x on a surface. It exerts a pressure P, the acceleration, so force due to gravity G, which expression gives the density of the metal cylinder. So what we are looking to say is our force, so our force down is m times g. Our mass, m, 
is equal to the density times the volume. And our pressure, P, is equal to our force, Mg, divided by the area. You can work out V in terms of the area and the height and all that, and then you can put that all into this equation and rearrange it to find rho as the subject, and that will give you one of these. Uh, yeah, that's, that's the best way of looking at that. Okay, a trailer of weight 13 kilonewtons is attached to a cab at X, as shown in the diagram. What is the upward force exerted at X by the cab on the trailer? Oh, so. Um. So what are they trying to get at here? They haven't given you enough measurements to do very much. Oh, I'm, I'm being stupid. Right, okay, so, <laughs> number one thing, pay close attention to the diagram. The trailer is being held up entirely by X at this end, right? For some reason, I thought that this wheel was attached to the trailer, and I was looking at it going, well, there's no force, so what's going on here? So, don't be an idiot like me. Um, there is your number one lesson. Very useful advice, as ever. So, what you are looking for is to balance moments, right? You need to balance moments, so balance them about this point. You have a clockwise moment of 30 kilonewtons at a distance of 10 meters. You have an anti-clockwise moment of x at a distance of 20 meters. So you have 10 times 30k is equal to x times 20. And that will get you that x is 15 kilonewtons. Right. I feel stupid, but there we go. I always do. It's wonderful. Um, the diameter of a solid metal sphere is measured using a micrometer screw gauge. We have an enlarged shaft of the micrometer. The mass of the sphere is 0 0.450 grams. What is the density of the metal used to make the sphere? So, um, I think, in principle, what they want you to do is read off the diameter from this uh, gauge. Uh, the principle here is that... Uh, does that look right? It does look right. Um, so the principle here is that this uh, circle runs from 0 to 50, essentially. Right, so it gives you your 0 0.5 increment by here. So you are at 4.5 by here, and you are adding 0 0.31. So your reading should come out at 4.81, unless I'm much mistaken. Uh, micrometers, because that says up there. Uh, that gives you a radius, a, a diameter, which is also a radius if you divide it by two. Um, once you've got your measurement, you can work out the volume of your sphere, and vol uh, mass divided by volume is your density. So there we go. Um, yeah, also worth remembering that your volume will end up in micrometers, so you want to, or your diameter will be in micrometers. If, if everything else is in meters, you want to convert that into meters before you do anything else with it. Okay, some gas in a cylinder is supplied with thermal energy Q. The gas does useful work in expanding at constant pressure P from volume V0 to volume Vf. 
as shown. Which expression gives the efficiency of this change? So efficiency is going to be your useful work over the total energy in. We have put in Q, so we want to have Q on the bottom. We have got out useful work P delta V, right? Work is P delta V. Delta V is VF minus V naught. So P VF minus V naught is our useful work. Q is what we put in. There we go. The power required to move an object through a medium at constant speed depends on the speed V and the resistive force F acting on the object. The resistive force F also depends on the words, too many S's, depends on the speed V. Which row shows a possible relationship between V, F and P? So, the idea is, if P depends on V and F, then P has to have a higher power of V than F does, right? The idea being that if F is proportional to some function of V and P is proportional to V F, then that's a higher power. We've multiplied it by V extra. And so the line that we want is this one, right? If f is proportional to v squared, p is proportional to v squared times v, which is going to be v cubed. Uh, these two, they're the same, and this one, we've said that p isn't constant. So there we go. All right. Which amount of energy is not 2,400 joules. So this is just to put it into a calculator question. Um, various formulae for energy, you've got uh, power times time, you've got gravitational potential, you've got kinetic energy. You just need to put them in and one of them won't be 2,400. That's not too, uh, not too awful. A hammer with 10 joules of kinetic energy hits a nail and pushes it five millimeters into a plank. The hammer and nail both come to rest after the collision. What is the approximate average force that acts on the nail while it moves through five millimeters? So this is work done is equal to force times the distance. In this case, we know the work done because we've used up 10 joules of energy. When we're at rest afterwards, there is no kinetic energy. So all of that energy has been used up. We know the work done. We know the distance, we can get an average force. The average force is just assuming that your force has been the same all the way through. That's what that means. A number of identical springs are joined in arrangements. Which arrangement has the same spring constant as a single spring? So, uh, the answer, unless I'm much mistaken, should be C. Should it? Should it be C? What question are we on? 20. Yes. So if you put two springs next to each other, that gives you double the spring constant. If you connect them to each other, that gives you half the spring constant. Here we have half the spring constant added to half the spring constant, which is just the original spring constant. This one's weird. Ignore it. This one's nice. It, in, the, in cases like this, where you've got three simple ones and one weird one, I would argue that the best way to do it is if you can find one that you know is the right answer, just go with that and ignore the complicated looking one until you have to do it, which in this case you don't. So ignore it. it makes your life a lot easier. A sample of material is stretched by a tensile force and uh, inelastically expanded. Which area represents the net work done on the sample? So the net work done is the area inside the curve, right? You can think about this two ways. Either you can know that, that it's x plus y, or you can think about it as, well, your work done on extending it was this total area, which is x plus y plus z. 
the work that you regained when it contracted was the area under force extension again, but this time that's just z. So you've got x plus y plus z minus z, which is x plus y. Or you can just know that it's the region inside. Um, but yeah. 22. Two sound waves have frequencies and the speed of sound. What is the difference between the wavelengths? So this is just your standard wave equation, v equals f lambda for the properties of a wave. v equals f lambda, well you've got v, you have f for each one, so you can work out lambda and subtract them. Remember to work out the lambdas and then subtract them rather than trying to do it using a change in frequency, because lambda is proportional to 1 over f. So delta lambda is not proportional to delta f or 1 over delta f. It's proportional to a bit weirder than that. So remember to find your lambdas on their own and then subtract them and not the other way around. Which, equa uh, which electromagnetic waves have wavelengths of this? That's just a definition question. You just need to know that. Um, which statement concerning a stationary wave is correct? Again, that's just a definition. Um, so yeah, one of those is a definition, the others aren't, so yeah. Continuous water waves are diffracted through a gap in a barrier in a ripple tank. What change will cause the diffraction of the waves to increase? So this is just talking about how does diffraction work, right? You diffract more as your gap gets smaller relative to the wavelength. Um, so the answer should be D. Oh, I'm doing strange things. The answer should be D. Yes, it is. Excellent. Uh, a parallel beam of light of wavelength 450 nanometers is incident normally on a diffraction grating with a certain number of lines per millimeter. What is the total number of intensity maxima observed? Uh, so you deal with this in terms of your diffraction grating uh, width, I believe. Uh, so the key to this question really is turning this into a width. And what you're saying is, well, one millimeter has 300 lines in. And so the, the width of any, the, the gap between any two slits is going to be one millimeter divided by 300, which will give you a certain number. And then you have n lambda equals uh, d sine theta. Sine theta's maximum is one. So n max lambda equals d, and you round it down to the nearest whole number, and that will give you one of these. Um, at a guess, the answer is going to be 14, just because those two are close together, so they're trying to see whether you know to round down rather than up. So at a guess, I would say it's c. Let's see if I'm right, without even doing the maths. No, it's d. It's a shame. Fair enough. Maybe it's still around, but yeah. Um, so yes, the answer is D apparently, but there we go, shame. If you do the maths, it works out either way. You don't need to try and guess. Fringes of separation X are observed on a screen one meter from a double slit that is illuminated. So this is just your double slit equation. Uh, at which distance from the slits would fringes of the same separation be observed when using blue light. So here, do you have this in your formulae? Uh, okay, no, so you're not given this anywhere. So, yeah, you're not given this anywhere, so you just need to know your double slit formula. Um, which apparently I don't off the top of my head, but there we go. That's my mistake. I apologize. Uh, you need your double slit formula and why do I not know that? That's appalling. Why L and D in some description? But yeah. 
Okay, I'm embarrassed by that. There we go. Uh, let's look it up quickly. What's okay? So, formula is n lambda equals uh, a y over. Uh, I'm calling it D in this case, where D is your separation to the screen, which is your uh, one meter. A is your uh, slit separation, which you don't know in this case, but you don't need it. Y is your fringes of separation X, and lambda is your wavelength. So what you are looking for is to say, well, Y, my separation, is proportional to lambda d in this case, right, if you multiply your d up. So if my wavelength has gone to two-thirds, then my distance has to go to three over two of its original, which is one and a half meters. Um, okay, a charged particle is moving in a uniform electric field. For the motion of the particle due to the field, which quantity has a constant non-zero value? Uh, Uniform electric field, charged particle, it's going to have a constant acceleration. Okay? Uh, force is proportional to acceleration, and there is a constant force if there is a constant charge in a constant field, so you get a constant acceleration. Um, which diagram could represent the electric field lines between two oppositely charged conducting surfaces? Do we have more? Yes, we do. Yeah. Okay, so there are... The, the key point to this is the idea of having conducting surfaces, right? If you have a conducting surface, the field lines are always going to be perpendicular to the surface when they touch it. And the only one that is true for is D. Always the field lines in this are perpendicular where they are touching. And so that's the one that works. All of the others, at least somewhere, they aren't perpendicular to the edge of the conductor. There is a current in a resistor for an unknown time. Which two quantities can be used to calculate the energy dissipated? OK. So, current, potential difference, resistance, they are all able to give you power. If you don't know time, power cannot give you the total energy. So those are no good. So then you need to do with totals. If you have total charge passing through and the potential difference, or well, potential difference is just the energy per unit charge. And so that will give you total energy. Total charge and the resistance doesn't work. <coughs> oh, my apologies. Um, okay. Two copper wires of equal length are connected in parallel. Potential difference is applied across the ends of this parallel arrangement. Wire S has a diameter of 3 millimeters, wire T has a diameter of 1.5 millimeters. What is the value of the ratio current? So, current I is inversely proportional to the resistance. And resistance is proportional to, uh, sorry, is inversely proportional to the area of your wire, right? The wider your wire, the lower the resistance. And lastly, area is proportional to the diameter squared. Putting all those back in, you can get that your current is going to be proportional to your diameter squared and then put in your ratio. Because your, your ratio of diameters is just two. Okay, a 100 ohm resistor conducts a current with changing direction and magnitude as shown. What is the mean power dissipated in the resistor? So, 
The way to do this is to recognize what is the repeating segment. And the repeating segment is this bit going from here to here, realistically. I'm just terrible at drawing accurately. Um, so that is our repeating segment. We have a total time of two milliseconds. Uh, and we have an average current, right? Now, the important thing to note is that your power dissipated P equals I squared R. So you are going to dissipate power in both of these. The negative doesn't really make any difference because when you square it, they're both positive. So you've got power of two times r uh, of four times r up here and one times r down here two squared is four minus one squared is one both of those for one millisecond and then that's the total energy right so power times the time that your power was going on for that gives you the total energy you've dissipated that over two milliseconds so divide that by two it's essentially a weighted average right it's this power times one plus this power times one over the total, which is two. And that will give you a total power, or an average power, rather. So, yeah. You would obviously get the same answer if you did it over, you know, three repetitions or something, but make your life easier. Which graph shows the current voltage characteristic of a filament lamp? That is just something that you need to know. Um, in the circuit shown, X is a variable resistor whose resistance can be changed from 5 to 500. Quite an impressive range. The EMF of the battery is 12 volts. It has negligible internal resistance. What is, what is the maximum range of values of potential difference across the output? So, essentially, all you want to do here is this is a potential divider circuit, right? You're going to get the same fraction of 12 volts as you have fraction of the total resistance. So just put in the minimum and maximum values and get out the answers, right? So you have 5 over uh, 5 plus 40 and 500 over 500 plus 40 times your 12 volts. That gives you your output voltage, and that gives you your answers. Okay, there is a current from P to R in the resistor network shown. Excellent. The potential difference between P and Q is 3 volts. Blah, blah. Okay, so that's just everything they've shown on the diagram, and we have a current. Which row in the table is correct? So. The simplest way to look at this is to do your uh, sums. If you have a, so if you call this one zero, you can effectively go through and add up, right? So that puts Q at three and S at five. So the potential difference from S to Q, Q and S is two, right? So that means it's gotta be one of these two. Then your R is at 9, and so your potential difference from S to R is 4, because again, we've just added 6 to 3. Just go through like that, adding them up and getting your differences. It's nice and simple. Okay, cool. Two resistors of resistance R1 and R2 are connected in parallel. What is the combined resistance between X and Y? Okay, this is just nice and simple. This is your definition of parallel of resistances in parallel, except that you need to do your rearranging slightly, right? Usually you have one over RT is one over R1 plus one over R2, and now you just need to rearrange it and make it into a nice form, but that's nice and easy. A voltmeter is used to monitor the operation of an electric motor. The motor speed is controlled by a variable resistor. 
Okay, what is the question? In which circuit is the voltmeter reading proportional to the current in the motor? Interesting. Okay. So. What we can say is, I think we are assuming here that our motor doesn't actually have any resistance, right? So the current is just proportional to, uh, we have generally V equals I R, right? So our current is proportional to, via the total resistance, to the, vol the total voltage. Um, so I would argue that just putting it across the supply would be the uh, simplest way, but perhaps not. What are they after? Uh, let's have a check. Oh, okay, right. Um, okay, so I see what they get. So what they are getting at here is the idea that for this to be consistently proportional, right, uh, the current in the motor is the current in the whole circuit, right? You have a series circuit. There's no parallel here. So your current in the motor is just the general current right? V equals IR. This is only proportional if the resistance is constant. And the resist, the only component in this circuit with a constant resistance is our constant resistor. And so we want to put our voltmeter over our constant resistor. The variable resistor, well, that's variable. The total resistance, well, that's varying with the variable resistor. This is varying with the variable resistor. So it's only this one where the R is constant. All right, that's what they're trying to get at here. So yeah. Okay, cool. Um, which statement decry describes beta decay in terms of a simple quark model? So the idea here is what are proton... So we know, that I, I, I suspect that most of you remember that beta minus is just regular electron decay that turns a neutron into a proton, right? Now, a neutron is up, down, down. A proton is up, up, down. So we've gone from down to up. Down to up emits an electron because beta minus. There you go. Which word equation? Well, so beta plus decay, now we're going the other way. We are turning a proton into a neutron. Beta plus is a positron. So we're going proton to neutron plus positron. Positron. A positron is an antiparticle. And so we need a particle to make up for it. So we need a positron plus an electron neutrino. So here we have an antiparticle and a particle. So we've conserved our particle number. That's the idea here. Last question, which statement about the alpha particle scattering experiment provides evidence for the existence of the nucleus? This is just learning. Uh, the idea that the main one is a tiny proportion of the alpha particles are deflected through large ang angles, right? Tiny proportion meaning that we have a small, dense nucleus. Um, that's, that's the key idea. So it's this one, right? Um, yeah. Okay, cool. So that has been the physics paper. Uh, hopefully this was helpful to you and I will see you next time. Goodbye.